TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are not live. But you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Uh, right behind me, you see it. This little warning screen just in case. Not saying that anything is necessary for this. Uh, don't forget, twitch.com is where you can catch any previous lives, future lives. The username is at the bottom of the screen. We also got Patreon. We post five days a week. And we got merch. The link to all of that is down in the description. This is Lad Bible TV, 32 minutes with Bugsy Malone. I'm interested. Talk to me. Copyright disclaimer under Section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. Allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. No copyright infringement intended. All rights belong to their respective owners. There we go. I grew up in an area called Crumsell and life growing up was life growing up was pretty interesting really in a way whereby my, my mum was doing her best to get me away from what was kind of going on in Manchester at the time which was a gang war um, Gunchester so I had family members that was involved in that and yeah, I think my mum was trying to shelter me from it. Especially in those years, 1980 to 1990. It's interesting, really, because there was this one time where I remember getting attacked as a little kid. I always bring it up to my mum, but she says it didn't happen. She said she was watching me out the window. But it was, it was a little bit rough. And then we moved from there. We moved to a place called Sedgley Park. I've noticed that when you bring up some trauma in your life and your mom was like a single mom, she might not acknowledge it you know what i'm saying that doesn't just happen like that happens i mean that happens often in the hood where your mom doesn't acknowledge something because it's, it's just like no that that couldn't have happened not on my watch type of but yeah it did. you can't see everything i'm not sure exactly what was happening but there was some trouble there there was some we lived in like a flat we lived on the second floor there must have been problems with this these this drug dealing family. Um, so that kind of kicked off. Um, and from memory, what happened is they was in they was in our flat one time, and the guy the guy tried to drop a glass cabinet on me, and he just missed. And my mum said I was brave, and I just like ran over it and went into the house. That must have been the last straw of some discrepancy. My mum's phone, my uncles, my uncles have turned up, and flipping, and the guy got mangled you know and it's one of my earliest memories I remember seeing it out of I've got a song what song have I got I've got a song called The Van Gogh Effect and I called it The Van Gogh Effect because I'm trying to paint pictures with words to explain the situation um, and just as a kid I, I remember hearing the situation I just heard the banging and the, the smashing and the screaming and that I reckon I was too young to know what I was seeing um, and then that's that and then we moved to then we moved to an area called Presswich, and then I went to and then I went to school up there. Where was your dad at this point? Dad went around, had a stepdad from about eighteen months old. Um, so he was there, but he was like working all the time. Did you get on with him? Like when I was young, yeah. Like when I was young, there was a period of time where everyone just got on, and my little sister was born. She's about five years younger than me, um, and then as the years went on. There was big fallouts in the house. It, it felt like my mum and my stepdad was breaking up for years, you know? And there was a lot of arguments and that kind of thing. Were you asking questions about your dad it's as well? Telling people, man. Kids remember that. They feel that type of energy. So if you're trying to hold it together for the kids, but you're still arguing in the house and all that energy is still there, it's, it's better to let it go. Because that's trauma that hangs tough to us. I mean, kids. At this point. 
Yeah, like as a kid, like the kids in school were saying, like, how come you black? How come you're black and your dad's white? You know what I mean, obviously, I knew my dad. I'd been introduced to him, but I, I, I don't. I don't know if I was interested in the technicalities around it. You know, just it just kind of was what it was. My stepdad, I loved him as a dad. He took me to football training. He got me Christmas presents without him. When I really got Christmas presents, my real dad wasn't like that, you know. But then what happened was he was. He started to get quite nasty towards me. I think in school, because we moved to Presswich, I was looking different. Got a song called M M E M One. I say I'm in school looking like Wesley Snipes, Ben Sherman's in a second hand bike. You get me? So the the other kids was different to me. They had a different family life. All of North, North Manchester's kind of like that. It's kind of mixed. A lot of mixed race, a lot of black, African, Jamaican, Asian. Indian, Pakistani, Irish, a lot of Irish. Like in my in my first school, no one was really poor. And people weren't necessarily rich, but they weren't like us. You know, and it went until I started going to other people's houses, and they're like carpets down and flipping. It was like a nice environment. That I understood that. We was living a little bit different. It was an interesting stage, really, between years. That's the that's the ages you figure it out when you start going to your homies' houses in high school and not high school and like when you were younger. You like hold on, man. It's hitting a different, little different way. You got real silverware. We be using plastic. You know what I'm saying? They be hitting like the six going into year seven. I'd stumbled across some some kids. Like dang, all your couches match. Mine all mismatch. Huh? It's that was like. Like come out, come and chill with us on this estate. So I went to go onto the estate. It was girls actually. Like girls seemed to like me, but boys was like threatened by me or something. The girls was like, come onto this estate. And I went over there and the boys mustn't have liked it. And this one of the kids pulls out a flipping screwdriver and just starts stabbing me in my legs and that. And I had this second hand bike flipping I don't know if you remember the days when Tesco's used to have like little advertisements, you could buy a bike, 40 quid, second hand, phone them up. So I had this little uh, mountain bike and they pulled my bike off me, they smashed it up. I like got my bike, I had to like run off basically. Um, Pre preservation, I told y'all, run it, run. If you outnumbered, ain't no acting tough. Get up out of there. Self-preservation, slide after. I found it quite embarrassing. In fact, I did find it embarrassing and I never, so I never told my family. I just like hid in the pants that I'd been stabbed in. Hid in my, the fact that my leg was bleeding. I remember it being damp for days and sticking to my pants and all that. To tell you the story of that situation, it's quite interesting. So that kid that stabs me is in year nine or year eight when I'm just coming into year seven. And he was after me in the, you know, when guys are looking for you. The, their little group of guys was looking for me in the six weeks holidays. So I stayed in for the whole six weeks holidays and go out. And I didn't tell my mum. She's like, Damn, oh. they had you put up? No, you was a kid, but they had you put up. Huh? Wow, if you want. And I was like, nope. I was scared. And then by the time I got you into school, like a year went by when you're just a kid in school, making friends or whatever. And then by about year eight, year nine, this kid's one of the toughest kids in the school now. He barges into me in the in the corridor, in the uh, and a, and an argument kicks off. But by this time, I'd like it's kicking off at home. It's getting quite violent at home. What also happened in that six so weeks you holidays, up or just after the six weeks holidays, my stepdad beat me up. And he used to do boxing, so he beat me up pretty bad. And that had never happened before. Not really. Do you know what I mean? He'd been like. He'd been abusive in that. But again, like I, I can only put the words abusive on it years later. Cause really I loved him. And really he was just telling me off. But when I look at now the way parents treat kids, it was a bit too far, do you know what I mean? He was angry for whatever he'd been through in life. I just remember coming into the house one night, an argument kicked off as it always would. And um, he stands up to confront me. Uh, and just being in shock as a kid, as a kid, I've like pushed him back, and he, he's just cracked me. 
And that was that, he beat me up pretty bad. But my mum was in the room and my mum let him do it and walked out of the room. Was he abusive to your mom too? And I'm like 11 or 12. I could never, and probably can still never, wrap my, my mind around how you would let an 11, 12 year old kid get beat up and leave it to happen. I just felt like, um, because my only explanation, like, my logic is he was aggressive to her as well. In some type of way, like mentally or phys I don't know physically. I don't want to speak on bro mom like that, but that's my guess. My there ain't no way. Mum couldn't love me, you know. And my stepdad wasn't my dad. And he'd show me that. So I'd become a lone wolf. And that, and, and that was that, that was that really. And then there was a period of time, what happened in this period of time was, just to rattle through it, I find, I find it quite deep, you know? I try to kill myself. My stepdad finds me, I'm like hanging off this flipping thing. He gets me down, he flipping, he's there for me and that. I go into school, the kid that stabbed me, we get into an argument, he wants me a fight, I say, I'll have you a fight. Like he's, he's cool, he knows how to kick off. I don't know, I don't know how to kick off, but, I know I'm willing to fight and I've punched my punch bag when I'm in a bad mood, so I'm not ready to go. I turn up onto the, his estate, I have him a fight. You went to his hood too? You was really out of pocket. You went to, you slid to bro Creed, uh, to his uh, block? And I win this fight. Right. And there was, there was a moment when I was fighting him, I rang one of my friends, he was like a kickboxer at the time and his brother was in the streets already. He was much cooler than me. And um, I said, I'm having a fight, will you come with me? He says, yeah, I'll meet you. So I felt like I had my little buddies with me and that. Okay. okay. We get onto the estate, these right. flipping 40, 50 people out there, music, drinking. So you ain't go dolo was my point. Everyone's like shouting the guys if to say I'm there. So I turn to my friend, I say flipping, I'm saying hit me, hit me in the chest. To, to gas me up to have this fight, he starts hitting me in the, in the chest and that. If anything, it just scared me more for having this fight because I thought if that's what punches feel like, I'm in trouble. <laughs> um, but then luckily the guy just kind of come out of nowhere, tried to hit me. Obviously my stepdad had taught me to duck and he taught me to punch. So I duck and I punch this guy and he flew back. Long story short, I beat him in a fight. And it was just a moment in a fight, yeah. You ever seen The Mask, Jim Carrey? He's on a fight in the, in the mask, yeah. Here's how much of a nerd I was, I was backwards at them times. Jim Carrey's fighting he's, and he starts beating this guy and he stops, he goes, I'm winning. And like that happened to me in a fight, like I'm on top of this guy. And I didn't know I had, a, my temper was so bad, all the things that have been happening to me at home, man, I had a bad temper, but I'd never really let it out, you know? I remember looking at this guy and thinking, right, I'm winning. And then obviously I got pulled up off him. Um, and. We just kept fighting, we kept fighting, and it was a point where he like bit me. Oh bit my, my arm god. and he bit my face. Oh my god. I was kind of pulled him off me and kept fighting. Yeah, you must have been beating the, the brakes off, buddy. For him to bite you, biting somebody is a very desperate move in a fight. You gotta be losing bad. And then I bit him back and then I gouged his eyes. When I gouged his eyes, he screamed, but when he- This how y'all get down in the match? Yeah, so you was winning and bit him, but you bit him for like payback. Like, oh, you bit me, love. this is how I feel. Bit me, I didn't scream. So then I started to understand that was tough, you know? I started to understand that like, I could look after myself. I didn't have to just be a victim. And what effect did it have on school and, and life outside of? Well, now I, think I'm, now I think I'm a cool kid. Because this kid that, that's meant to be one of them. I remember going into school after I had a fight with this kid and some girl was like, look, there he is, there's no marks on his face. And this other kid's face must have been mashed up, you know? So, so all of a sudden, now the cool kids are touching me down and showing me respect. Yeah, that's how I be feeling, low key. That day after you win that fight in school, the next day, oh man, you, hey, listen. You feel like that 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 dude. Hey, look, there you go. Ah, boy, you had him, blink, 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 blink. Well, you was doing, you was putting in work, you boxed? Yeah. Bet. Well, that was all too much for my ego. So I thought I was double cool. And um, then when I did start to be kicked out, 
like all the other kids had built a group, friendship groups. I didn't really have that. So I just turn up by myself on a BMX. All I really knew was like fighting on the streets. The streets like scared me a bit. So if I was turning up somewhere, I'd be turning up to fight with one of the cool kids or maybe link up with someone that I knew from school. And I remember one night on a park, there was a gang called LHG, Little Hill Gang, from where I'm originally from, you know, and where my family's from. But I don't know none of these kids. I maybe, I've maybe come across them with my uncle, but I've never chilled with them. And they used to just come on the park, they used to beat everybody up, and they used to flip in, rub everybody's stuff and bounce. And when they, when they came this night, I was like, you aren't robbing me. Because I was just angry and I just wanted to fight and flipping, get into problems. Anyway, me and this one kid, we get into an argument. I'm saying you're not robbing me. I had a mate that was there that I remember from school. He had a little comb over. I said, no, don't run. He didn't run. And then as me and this kid are arguing, and he can see I'm not scared of him, he pulls out a gun. Mm. And as he, as he pulls out this gun, I've only at this point seen guns on television. So I don't understand the ramifications of getting shot. So yeah, you ain't understand with that with that brun. You know, so I um So you I, ain't really had no fear to it, no reaction to it, right? I said, put that down, come on the grass, and I'll smack you already. And he's freaking him out, I'm not scared. Really, I'm naive. Yeah. And he's like, he's like, I'm from Cheetah Mill. I'm, like, I'm from Cheetah Mill. Crumsel, where I'm, where my first house was, he's next to Cheetah Mill. All my family's from Cheetah Mill. So I start naming all, he's like, who do you know from Cheetah Mill? So I start naming even the straight members in my family. And then when I got to a certain uncle's name, he classed my uncle as his uncle as well because of my uncle's position in the hood. Everyone just respected him. He'd give the kids money and that kind of thing. And that was that. That's how I ended up in a gang. Me and this kid made friends. Me and this kid started chilling and he was interested in making some down looking after himself as well. And that was that, you know? That's normally how it be happening low key sometimes. Man, who you know over there? Blah, 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 blah. Oh, oh for real, I know bro. Oh man, you good, what's up? We got to the streets. The gang would come to get me from school. So I'd been like, I'd been like flipping geography. And 15 man would turn up from Cheetah Mill, ballied up, gloved up, looking for me. And they'd just burst into my lesson. They'd be like, Bugs, come, come. And that was that, do you know what I mean? And then we'd just be, and the teachers thinking, what's going on here? And we'd just be out on the roads, you know? So quite quickly, I was making myself at home in the gang. You know, I had nowhere to live. My household was dysfunctional, so. I understood everybody's home situation, which is where, when you see a lot of the stabbings and all that going on on the street, that's where it really kind of stems from, is the, the household being all over the gaff. The gang became my family, you know, and I loved them, and I would have died for them, you know, and and they would have died for me. And what about um, the police? Do you have any run-ins with the police at all? Yeah, that was just like every week, innit? I was what you call a persistent young offender. You know, I get that means I would get arrested <laughs> nearly every week. Some of these kids was rougher than me, tougher than me, you know, cooler than me. But when I look back now, a lot of their mums loved them. So they had love at home. And I, I just didn't have access to that. So when they would go home and have like a family situation, I'd be like tagging along with people, which would just mean I was on the streets longer than other people. And I would just get arrested a lot. So I remember being in a few occasions where People have been stabbed to death, you know? And you're just there. Between that and understanding the f You was a misfit. Mm -hmm. story of my uncle, MEN1, I'm talking about. My uncle's face got tore out by the pellets of a shotgun like Frankenstein. You know, like, as you're hearing your uncle's story, and really I was trying to be like him. I didn't have a, a father figure to look up to. I didn't respect my stepdad anymore. My real dad wasn't there for me. He didn't care. He treated my mum bad. I didn't like it. So my uncle became like the, the the guy that I really looked up to. See, that's what I mean. Remember, remember, I said it earlier. Your mom didn't protect you in that instance because she was scared of dude too. She was treating him bad too. She was getting treated bad too. So I was hearing stories about him. Your mom probably knew, like, man, you tough, man. I'm not. If I say something to him, you can't defend me. You know what I'm saying? So 
you tough. Just take this. I'm going to just be quiet and say something later, maybe. Plus spending time with him and trying to be like him, you know? You see, gang culture's a, a biz... In them days, it was a business. It's a game. You got to be serious about the rules of the game. If you're not serious about the rules of the game, you get your brain splattered, you know? So I, and I got caught slipping a few times. I got my tooth, I got my tooth punched off an older guy one night. Had a couple of fights, lost a couple of fights. Yeah, man, I got caught slipping one time. It wasn't even my fault, but I took my little L. I got jumped though, so couldn't nobody see me one on one. <laughs> I've been put one on five. You still really couldn't see me. But I got jumped five on thirty. There were five of us, thirty of them. So I told the story before, y'all know. A couple of older guys um, got chased with guys trying to shoot us, got arrested on attempted murder charge. Hey. Nearly done a long time in jail. So a lot was going wrong because I wasn't organised, you know? And then the more that I started to understand the way that my uncle had, had built what he'd built, the more I understood that I wasn't being serious about the whole thing, you know? I went to a, like a little gathering of my uncles and um, I went in there, I'm blacked out, got my knife on me, I've got my gloves, I'm, I've got my body with me, like I'm in the game now, innit? And I've got a little rep reputation as a, as a young guy, people aren't messing with me. And really I'm looking at the, my family, I'm thinking I'm gonna be the main one. Out of all the cousins, I'll be the one that takes our name up a level. A long story short, my uncle had had I tried to call a truce between two guys. The two guys had turned up. No one was supposed to bring weapons. One guy brought a weapon. He, he blows the other guy's brains out in my uncle's house. Damn. And that took an effect on my uncle's mental health. So then he said he was flipping, lay with the guy, holding his head together, waiting for the ambulance to come. But at that time, my uncle's mental health was just kind of up and down and that. So he used to snap. And when he used to snap, it was, he would snap bad. I've ended up saying the wrong thing at, at this gathering one night. And I remember there was this machete in the kitchen uh, with like dried, what looked like dried blood on it. And flipping, I've said the wrong thing. And he snaps. I actually speak about this in my new, in my latest album, in my last freestyle. I say, when he pulled the machete out, I really could have pissed my pants. But I was young, okay? Because I'm, 15, it all happened in this short period of time. And he, he sends my cousin to go and get this machete because what he says is my punishment is I've got to lose a finger. My cousin goes in, obviously he's scared and he likes me, he don't want me to get chopped, you know? And my uncle had done certain things so everybody's really worried, you know? So then my, my uncle picks me up and s slams me through a table, and, like puts his foot on my head. I'm like flipping just on the floor. I I'm having to like grab myself so I don't flip him, piss my pants. Anyway, he goes in, he gets his machete. He says, put, put your hand on the Bible. Put my hand on the Bible and he, and he goes to chop my hand, I pull my hand out, I run away. And for me, just something changed in me, man. From that moment on, I just like, I stopped trusting anybody. You know, and then what happens in your gang is your gang ends up turning on you, you're all turning on each other. No one's loyal in that life. And I just kind of- I like that he being real about the gang culture. Cause at the end of the day, when you really indulged in there and you 10 toes down, like you think they'll die for you. You think, you know what I'm saying? A couple of them will, you know, it is gang gang, you know what I'm saying? But like, but let's be frank. It's some young scared kids in them gangs too that really ain't living like that, that just fit, that want to be a part of the crowd, though. You know, bravery is in numbers sometimes. I'm glad he being real right now. Become like a lone wolf. I had like one or two friends. And after that, I just decided like, I wasn't going to be f with again. And, um, and I was going to make some serious money. I earned some money, I, I saved some money. But then I got depressed. I had a, bo I had a boxing match. When I, got, I went to jail when I was 16. I was in jail representing Manchester. I remember just being sat in jail and 
I'm feeling lucky that I didn't I didn't get much longer. How much did they give you? Just under a year, 16. So what young, had, young offenders? Young offenders, and what had, what had happened is in the court case, he says one year to run concurrent with, two years for this offence to run concurrent with, another year, by the end it racked. But, but they're concurrent charges. Took to like eight. But when I asked the, the, the guard, how long have I actually got? He says, two years. On good behaviour, you'll get out in under a year. Yeah. So really that was like, I don't know, as a, as a gang member, you seen people get five years, six years, seven years. So in your head you think, yeah, if I do two or three, I'll, I'll still have a life when I get out. You just don't want to do a life sentence and that. It almost felt like jail kind of saved my life. Cause it pulled. That's a good thing. Another thing he's saying, you know, sometimes jail do work for the right minded people. If you really want to be out of that situation and out of that way of living, you know what I'm saying? Jail will take you out the street for however long, you know, it'll let some of your beefs die down. It'll, it'll, it'll preserve you. So when you get out, you like, okay, everything to die down. Let me give, let me be on my, my, my stuff now. Pulled me out of the streets when it was getting quite chaotic. See? Um, and I made a plan from jail to succeed. I had, to re I had to reconsider what I was trying to be a street guy for. What had happened is I'd got carried away in the, I got carried away in the, the, the lifestyle of being a gang member. And what that basically is, is you hurt people, people try and hurt you, somebody dies for no reason. And I started to understand like, actually I'm a hustler. And then when I got to, as I had the time to think, I thought like, why am I hustling? I thought I'm hustling because my household's hell. That's what I would see. Okay, now Bugsy, you're talking to me now. Me and Bugsy got like the low key same story. What? I avoided jail time. My lawyer was a one. You know what I'm saying? Even when I was younger, I was bad. But I was so bad when I was young. Uh, but we got like the same origin story. It sounds like low key. Low key is very similar. Where I come from, there's no carpets smell of these arguments all the time over dough. Um, and actually I thought like, I, I'm not interested in losing because I know where losing puts you, it puts you in a place where you don't want to come out of your house and you flip in, you can feel suicidal and depressed if you're not careful, you know? So at that point, I already had trust issues because of my family. Sh so that sort of made me stop trusting anybody to be in control of my future. So it's at that point, I decided to become the, the designer of my own destiny, you know? I, I decided to, to plan it out and how it was gonna look. So then that's what made me pursue music. But I just wanted to get to a place where- It sounds like you start living life with a purpose. And once you start living life with a purpose, everything begins clearer. We're talking about your dad again, because you thought about fixing that with your real dad. I never, I never really spoke to him again. In fact, I fell off my motorbike, had a bike accident, I had bleeding on the brain or whatever. And after it happened, the news was, was reporting it like I was, I was dying. And he phoned me. And when I woke up on a hospital bed, the nurse was like, your dad's phoned. So I'm thinking, which dad's this? Because I didn't speak to any of them. And when, I, and when we had the conversation, I said, look, by the way, it's all over between us. I said, even if they, they come back to you and say I'm dying, don't come looking for me and I won't come looking for you. And that's what I had to do. I had to take, I had to take my emotional investment out of these dysfunctional people that was going to pull me down into hell with them. Music was in the beginning days where I was trying to make my career go off. I think a lot of people, they asked for me to put my old mixtapes on Spotify. I think what people like about their mixtapes is I didn't expect anybody to listen. So if I was, and when I was depressed and in a really vulnerable place, I would just, I would explain that in songs. A lot of people don't understand what artistry and rap be, man. I be doing these reactions to music, man. I, I just be on an entertainment thing too, but like a lot of your, lot, music is a, it comes from a real place. You know what I'm saying? And you can tell when it's coming from a real place. Like the artists themselves, they know it's coming from a real place when they really trying to rap, when they really down bad when they really putting they all into this and, and, and 
they think nobody want to hear that. But, like, no, we want to hear. Tell us a story. Like, that's what the thing is with these brand new rappers that be coming out, bro. You don't be telling us nothing. You don't be getting... You don't be getting candid with us. You don't be letting us in. So we don't give a fuck about you. You drop a song and it's done. Because it's all cap. When you starting your career off, you got to let us in. We got to know you. If we don't know you, then it's you're dead. Eventually. You might be popping like for a month or two, a year maybe. Year and a half, two years max. But if you in those two years you've never let us in, we're gonna you're gonna eventually fall off because we really don't know you. You capping like we gonna get to think of you capping. All of this is for money for you, which it is. You know you you rap to get out the gang. You rap to get out out of your situations. You rap to be live a different lifestyle. But if you wanna succeed and you want longevity, at some point you gotta let us in. And people like Bugsy, you know what I'm saying? People like Wretch, like people like Kanan, like people like, you know what I'm saying? They let us in early. That's why they're legends. They're legendary. Gigs too. I put Gigs in there. He let us in early. You know what I'm saying? And then, and then there's these other rappers who just rap just because, oh, let me say this. It sounds good. Let me say that. It sounds good. That's why you're falling off. And that's why drill rap is so, it's so, it's it's hard. It's hard to be a drill artist in the UK right now. Because you don't, like, you. everybody wants to do it. But everybody ain't a real gangster. Everybody not living like that. Like, the, like, on a real authentic drill rapper, you gonna know. You could feel it. You know what I'm saying? When somebody just doing that just to sound good, like, bro. It's cool. Will I ever listen to it again? No. And it sucks that genre because all the best drill artists, like 90% of the best, they're all locked up because they was really living like that. And we, we have already crowned them as the best of the best because they was authentic. It was real. They gave, they let us in. Like, you, you, dang, they letting us in. I really feel what he's talking about because he's letting you in. It don't sound scripted. It hit different, man, I'm telling you. Just early stage of the music career. Like, what, so, what so you start, what, where in, it started. Yeah, like, I live in this guy's house. And he had a brother that lived in London. Um, his brother come from London. I remember being in the kitchen. This is so, I feel so silly saying these things out loud. I've never even said these things out loud. And because I've been kicked out of my house, I'm in the kitchen downstairs. Because obviously you feel uncomfortable when you're living in someone's house. There's a mom, a dad, these brothers in there. You just want to stay out of everybody's way, right? Yeah. And I'm sad, you know? And my mate's my gang mate. I don't want to go crying to him that I'm sad. I remember going in the kitchen. I'm just crying to myself in the dark. And the brother must have come down for a drink. He switched on the light and seen me there, you know? And, and I was doing music at the time. And he was like, yo, man, just keep with doing your music. You're gonna make it and that. And that's really what them old mixtapes were. I remember a song where the lyrics are something along the lines of, I used to believe I could trust anybody, but now I feel like I cannot trust a soul. And I'd just be in the bedroom, I had a little box room. And you're literally talking like a bed. And by the way, I'm very grateful that they let me stay. It was an amazing time for me, because I had nowhere else to live. And it was a little bed, and then you're talking half the length of the bed, or the width of the bed, was like a little walkway, where you could just fit like your trainers. You know what I mean? And that was my, that was my bedroom. He said that he could just hear me in there writing lyrics, and that's where a lot of my early mixtapes kind of came from. And as time's gone on, and I've done better in my life, and obviously fans have identified with the stories that I've told because I've been quite vulnerable about yeah, He was vulnerable. He let us in. People identify with other people's vulnerables. And we, when, when a fan like identifies with you, we looking at you like, bro, you brave for telling that story. I wish I could. I'm a fan. <laughs> All right. And I've gone on to make money and study hundreds of hours of psychology and psychologically get myself in a good place. Like, my head was gone. 
Like I was probably genuinely experiencing psychosis. I was a madman, unpredictable, you know? And I had to fix myself. And, and it's that simple, I had to develop structure and build a business and earn some money and, and build a life for myself. There are circumstances and situations that, you, that, that do stand out, that come out in your music. Like, for example, like, you know, your cousin passed away. When my little cousin died, Dane, um, I met him when I was about eight. And what had happened is there was another black family around the corner from my mum's when I was young. And we must have walked past each other in the street. And I was like, mum, can, can I go over to his house and, and chill? And he was called Aaron. We had the same name. So he wasn't my cousin. Because you, you're eight, nine, whatever the age was, you call each other cousins, right? Um, so then Dane came over from Jamaica when we was about nine. I could relate to I could relate to Dane more. I, Aaron had some money and a, and a, a decent life at the time, but Dane understood struggle like I did. When I got locked up, Dane gets sent back to jail because I wasn't there to look after Dane. So they, so 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 we had to look out. Sorry, mate. <clears throat> so, we, <clears throat> so we had to look after himself. Um, and he, um, and he, had a, he has a fight with a guy and he wins the fight and he sent him back to Jamaica. And um, he sent him back to Jamaica and <clears throat> he told me that he was, um, I got out, out of jail. <clears throat> and I phoned him. <sighs> Man, I told him, I told him what I was going to... See, told him. I told him I was going to bring him home, you know? I said, I'm getting my money up, I'm going to bring you back. I said, stay out, stay out of trouble, man. I said, Jamaica's dangerous. Stay out of trouble. <sighs> See, stay out of trouble. And then... Um, be careful, you know. And um, and I remember part life one year before my career took off. I got told that um, they fell off the top of a bus. They fell off on top of a bus. Cracked his skull. He had bleeding on the brain. Damn. And that he was. Um, and he'd been, he'd been in a, a coma. And then he came out of the coma and I prayed, I prayed to God. And this, man, this is where I was stupid because I didn't understand, <clears throat> I didn't understand the power of faith. I didn't understand the power of belief. I didn't understand the power of God. So I, I asked if, if he can survive and he don't have to live like a vegetable, like let him live. But if he's if he has to live like a vegetable for, for the rest of his life, he's got no quality quality of life, let him go. And then part of life came one year and I got called and told that he, you know, his body couldn't his body couldn't handle it once he came out of the coma. Um and and yeah. And he passed away. Dane was my last best friend. <laughs> You know, <clears throat> Dame, <sighs> sake. Dame was the, over to my ex-girlfriend, Dame was the, the last person that I trusted, you know? And I couldn't get him back, I couldn't get him back in time. And now he's, and now he's gone. People going like I'm talented. When really, all that's happened is I've kept going. People think I'm handsome, people think I'm in good shape. That boy was all of that. So, yeah. So I decided that. Lucky man, he just gave y'all a message inside of a message. He said, "People think I'm talented, but no, I just kept going." I'm telling you, that's what that's 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 another thing. If you just keep going, man, listen, consistency will take you places that you will not even believe that you could got have got.
I decided that I was going to make it my job to reach into the households of these kids, you know, and offer them some support um, and explain to them how it's done. you got to learn to speak well, you know, because you don't, how can you get your education? Your mum's an alcoholic, your stepdad's barring you. How do you do it? So you're going to get in trouble. You're going to have fights. You're going to end up robbing people. You're going to end up in a gang. I, I relate to all, I understand all that. But what I say is, you've got to educate yourself. Find the things that you're interested in. Learn to speak well. Build your principles. You're not a scumbag. A lot of my old gang friends, the reason we fell out was, I was back in the gang. I was backing my friend because it's like, no one gets to hurt him because he backs me up. So that's why I was in gang violence. I didn't want to hurt no one for no reason. Even though it ended up happening, you end up in these mad robberies and mad situations go down, you know? But then eventually you have to build your own principles and become a better person. Like people that don't know my music will listen to my music and be like, oh, he just talks about the same thing all the time. It's not that I'm doing that. I've studied hundreds of hours of psychology. So what I do is I take my stories and I break them down and I put the details, the nuances that, that, that a therapist can't tell you, the government can't tell you. And I break down how you transcend that situation. If your mum's on drugs, here's how it looks. If, you, if your mum was a prostitute, if your dad was a drug dealer, if your uncles kill people, whatever the it is, I understand being there. And that's what I've committed myself to doing. That's what my music is. That's what my new album is. My new album is the blueprint for real strugglers, you know, because I get, I get so many of these messages that I can't help everybody. So now what I try and do is with the fact that my mum taught me to paint and the, own, the, the last good days of my life was spent painting it. I just try and take that artistic education, what I've got and make artwork. That's why you, you, I speak down on these other rappers. Really, I've got respect for these other rappers. But actually, I believe none of them are artistic like I'm artistic. None of them are creative like me. None of them have come from the dark where I've come from and got to the height that I've got to. That's my, that's my whole argument. And within these works of art that I'm making, it goes over people's heads sometimes, but that's fine. I don't mind. Because <laughs> the people I'm trying to speak to, they hear the message. I was a very sensitive kid. Mm, I'm going to go listen to the new album. Simple as that. That's a good one. W Lab Bible. T T L L leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn your post on.